We have a few minutes for uh, discussion uh, and questions. If you would like to speak, uh, please uh, indicate that. Uh, I'd like to make one uh, remark just to, as part of the context for our discussion. Different countries have very different approaches to the issues we're talking about. There is, I think, uh, no doubt uh, in my mind that the worst abuses of our time are coming from the United States, which is the most powerful country and by far the most right wing of any major country, uh, with the least attention to social welfare, to equality, uh, to solidarity. Uh, and Trump is, uh, in my opinion, the uh, continuation of a disastrous trend of a collapse of the social order in the United States. Uh, absolutely the most sociopathic leader that we've had uh, probably in American history. So I, I don't want to overgeneralize, uh, and I would like us to make distinctions because what we're saying does not apply to Scandinavian countries. Uh, by no means. Uh, it does not apply to many other countries uh, which are trying to find creative, uh, inclusive policies. But it does apply to the most powerful country in the world and the one that has the most influence on international institutions. And now where it is using direct threats every single day, uh, threats of retaliation, threats of illegality, breaking international law, uh, threats of uh, personal retaliation, uh, presidents uh, holding up uh, development aid or threatening uh, France uh, if it goes forward with uh, normal taxation and so forth with direct retaliation. This is the context that we're dealing with, I think it's important to say. We're talking about power. Uh, we're not just talking about uh, a, a world ideology. That's good because not every country is as uh, dark and uh, perverse as the United States is. So uh, the floor is open. Please, would you like to speak? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. A, a brief comment, and actually, also, will self save some time when I actually have a chance to speak. So, um, I'm really glad that we are introducing to a debate uh, over the last 20 years. The debate about inequality exclusion has been mostly done in terms of efficiency, at least from the economic point of view. So it's, so it's very refreshing when issues related to ethic solidarity are brought into the, into the conversation. Um, I remember I remember a long time ago when I was a graduate student, when people started uh, talking about inequality, uh, the, the most strongest argument were along the lines of uh, very unequal societies accumulate very slowly human capital. That affects growth, and that's why inequality is bad. It was an, an efficiency argument. It's, it's inequality is bad not because there are very poor people and are very few wealthy, it's just because it does not allow the economy to reach uh, their potential. And one, one issue that, uh, that is very important when we it brought these this issues is that also economies and, and the structures that are behind them require certain, certain uh, social agreement about the direction of a country. Change is not easy. Uh, Professor Stiglitz mentioned something like we don't, we don't need minor tweaks, yeah, but, but, but large tweaks require social agreement and, and, and social agreement require an open discussion about the direction in which the countries are, 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 are heading. And that requires probably to introduce issues about solidarity, intergenerational fairness uh, to the conversation. It cannot be only in economic terms because that takes you only so far. Thank you. Everybody's so quiet. Who would like to speak? Please.
uh, pre press the uh, request. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Professor Stiglitz uh, or uh, Minister Guzman uh, about monetary policy given your research. Um, I think one of the, I think it's, uh, it's a pretty well accepted fact now that um, the extremely accommodative monetary policy we've seen um, in the past 10 years, um, certainly in our country, I, th I think we can say is, is, a, is the accepted approach from, uh, from a bipartisan standpoint. I think um, uh, you even have the, obviously the president hectoring his own Fed chair, as we all know, uh, to, to lower rates. As the question is, if we, assuming you, you um, accept the notion that this has, that extreme monetary, accommodated monetary policy has been part of the, um, the root of some of the gross inequality we've seen in the last 10 years in terms of asset prices being concentrated in the hands of a very few, what's the, what's the approach or solution to this apparent paradox? Joe. Um, well, the, the, the point is that the mix of monetary and fiscal policy to sustain the economy has been all wrong. Uh, what we needed in the aftermath of the financial crisis was much more fiscal policy. And it was very evident that there was very high returns ways of spending money, fiscal, uh, uh, we, we needed uh, uh, to fight climate change. Uh, we needed infrastructure investment. We needed more social protection. We needed more investment in human capital, more research. So there were ample opportunities for spending money on just investment that would have yielded returns that the real interest rate was negative. And these were yielding very high returns in excess of those. Uh, and so just from a narrow economic point of view, that would have stimulated the economy, created jobs, created more equality, without the kind of wealth inequality that was associated with QE. The argument that was put forward was by supposedly put, put forward by uh, the opposition, by the, quite frankly, by the Republicans, was it would require deficit financing and we couldn't afford that. But that was clearly, I, I don't know, it was clearly a lie because uh, in December 2017, they passed a tax cut for the billionaires and for corporations didn't lead to more investment, led to almost a trillion dollars of share buybacks and dividends, and uh, contributed again to more inequality and uh, didn't stimulate, you know, the growth gave a, a short burst to growth, but not a sustained uh, burst to growth. So the answer is very clearly, monetary policy had reached its limits, and what we needed is more fiscal policy. Now the issue, facing the Fed at one point was, okay, given that the, we can't get more fiscal policy through Congress, what should you do? And that was a little bit more of an agonizing decision. I still think within that, they could have taken a more active role in directing finance to small and medium-sized enterprises, more role to making sure that the flow of money went in an appropriate way. And part of the neoliberal ideology that I referred to was just leave it to the market. And market's allocation of credit, as some, several of the people have taught, was not uh, socially desirable. Kristalina. It wasn't addressed to me, but I, uh, I would like to um, uh, make uh, two points. Uh, one is, uh, if you wish, in defense of central banks, uh, because they have been holding the fort over the last years. Uh, we uh, issued in um, October last year a warning that 
we are facing a synchronized slowdown. 90% of the world measured in GDP was slowing in 2019, uh, and just a year before, 75% was accelerating. So there was a, a, a rather uh, delicate moment for the world economy. And what we have seen is central banks uh, stepping up. Uh, 49 central banks have cut interest rates in a synchronized manner, 71 cuts. And what we have to uh, recognize is that uh, according to our estimates at the IMF, that has lifted up global growth by half a percentage point, just about the difference between recession and no recession. Now, that being said, there, and this is my second point, there are two problems with it. One, it should not be just the job of central banks. And uh, for quite some time, there has been cry for fiscal policy and most importantly, structural reforms to step up. Uh, I would add to that with, with due attention to, uh, to inequalities, not only because inequalities are bad for growth and uh, they are bad for growth, uh, but also because it creates um, uh, frictions in, uh, in the social fabric. And we have seen in 1919, the phenomenon of people being on the street spontaneously in a number of, of, of countries. Uh, but the second part of the, of the issue here is, uh, and we have been issuing this warning time and again, that there are unintended consequences. The law of unintended consequences in, is, full, is in full swing. What are they? One, when money is cheap, from households, to businesses, to governments, borrowing goes up, up, up. Uh, we registered 188 trillion, again, a record high uh, level of, of debt. Um, and that increased borrowing sooner or later will give us a big uh, headache. For some sooner, uh, for others later, but this is there. More importantly, with cheap money, there is also low return in the normal way, and the appetite for risk taking goes up. In search of yield, we see also increased risk for the, uh, uh, for the financial uh, uh, system of the world. And as you said in your, in your question, we also see shift towards equities, and that is in a way redistribution of wealth that doesn't go through parliaments. Uh, so for all these reasons, we have been making time and again this point that there has to be much more balanced economic, uh, a mix of economic uh, policies. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, with uh, the exhaustion of monetary policy space, which is for many countries already there, uh, there would be more, more attention uh, uh, to that. So it's not just for the U.S. I think it is something for the world to pay uh, close attention. I'd like to uh, also uh, mention uh, part of the problem comes from the entire way that uh, our governments are uh, organized and from uh, macroeconomic, the macroeconomics profession. In 2009, when the crisis was very deep, uh, what the macroeconomists, uh, especially in the Obama administration, called for was an immediate stimulus. And within six weeks, there was a uh, vote for a $900 billion stimulus. It had no plans. It was short term. It was, I was completely against it at the time and said to the president at the time, take six months and make a plan for a strategy. Uh, and uh, I, I will quote myself just for a moment. Uh, macro, macroeconomists trained in the past, this is from 2009, which I gave to him. Macroeconomists trained in the past 30 years believe that demand increases depend mainly on interest rates and deficit or tax levels. Yet increased spending on renewable power, a robust power grid, carbon capture and storage, wastewater treatment, fast intercity rail, higher education, 
and so on will depend on establishing a policy framework that harmonizes regulations, land use, public finance, and private investment. Large-scale stimulus, in other words, requires a nitty-gritty of public-private planning, technology assessment, demonstration projects, and complex project financing. This is not what macroeconomics is. Macroeconomics is turning dials. Uh, so pump in more money, more QE, give a short-term stimulus. So this is why we can't make structural change, because it requires thinking, knowledge, ecology, integrating systems. In the United States, we have no mechanism in public policy for this right now. We have no planning apparatus at all in the White House. Doesn't matter whether it's Trump, who couldn't plan five minutes ahead, or Obama, who decided not to plan at all, because we have no mechanism for creating this kind of public infrastructure. We built nothing new at the national level in 40 years since the interstate highway system. That was the last large-scale public effort. And this is uh, what misses in macroeconomics. It's not about aggregate demand. It's about mobilizing resources for the social good. But that's not how we train macroeconomists. Please. I would like to underline very, very briefly an implication of the presentation made by Adela Cortina. If we follow her argument, she is uh, telling us that uh, the solidarity principle <laughs> is not the final one, it's the final but one, because it's still based uh, on the exchange principle. So if we want to get rid of aporophobia, we need to move from solidarity to fraternity. Only the fraternity principle is uh, capable of taking into account uh, the, the welfare of those who have nothing to offer in exchange, both direct. Is it correct? Would you accept that, Adela? Well, I think that uh, the problem is the economy. Economies has not uh, has not uh, an idea of uh, this aporophobia. Economy has not in account the idea of that uh, poverty must uh, end and uh, and construct mechanisms on this uh, on this line. <coughs> I think now is the the time to, to recognize that uh, everybody has this dignity and that the mechanisms must be created. And uh, I think this is the, the idea of this, uh, of this seminar and then of uh, our work in the 21st century, because it's a question not only of solidarity, but also of justice. Justice with the dignity of human being. And uh, we must construct a, a world uh, with the idea of human dignity and with a democracy with equal people and not with inequalities. I think this is the idea of us. Wonderful. Thank you for a wonderful session for all of the speakers uh, and all of the interveners. And we have a coffee break now.